some of the other benefits of the Mediterranean diet are things like reducing inflammation, so the anti-inflammatory properties due to the high intake of those wonderful fruits and vegetables and healthy fats. It's great for, you know, the reduction of inflammation. Also, I love this part of it, is lowering the risk of mental health disorders like depression like we discussed in last week's episode. And the other one that I really love is improved gut health. Welcome to the Eat, Live and Move podcast by Miyagi, a space where we bring you the latest science-backed conversations, expert insights and practical tips relating to all things health and wellness. Hello, I'm Dr. Gina Cleo, your personal habit change expert. And I'm Dr. Ross Walker, cardiologist and preventative health expert. Together with our 60 plus years of collective experience, we're on a mission to help you to improve your health and transform your habits so that you can eat, live and move better one episode at a time without the fluff or the fad. Remember to hit subscribe so you can keep us in your ears. Ross, how are you doing today? How's your week been? Uh, Week's been very busy, but uh, as always, very enjoyable. So I'm fine. What about yourself, Gina? Same thing. I've had my book launched a week ago, I think now, or maybe two weeks ago. Excuse me. What is the name of this book again? It's called The Habit Revolution. Get it wherever good books are sold online. You can have it on Audible. But it has been an amazing whirlwind. It's, um, yeah, it's been easily the busiest fortnight of my life, but also really enjoyable. So it's been good. Excellent. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm sure it is a must read and I can't wait to read it myself. Oh, thanks, Ross. I'll have to send you one. Now, today's episode is long awaited. We've been saying for a little while now that we were going to dedicate an entire episode to the Mediterranean diet. So today we're going to do exactly that. We're going to talk about what it is, what exactly about this pattern of eating makes it so good for us, and also have a closer look at what the the actual diet entails, like what does a day on the Medi- Mediterranean diet look like? And of course, as always, we're going to hit you up with some practical tips on how you can start to eat more like the Mediterraneans do to reap all those wonderful health benefits. Ross, I'm so pumped for this episode. You know why? I love talking about food. It's literally why I became a dietitian, just so I could talk about food all day shamelessly. But I do want to preface that although I am a dietitian, I haven't worked in the dietetic space for a really long time. So I'm going to be handballing you to help me along, especially with some of the science today. Yeah. Well, I'm not a dietitian, but I do know a little bit about uh, about the scientific aspects of food. Don't ask me to cook anything, but I'll certainly happy to eat it. But look, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Mediterranean diet for one reason. It is easily the only diet in the world that has a very strong evidence base, apart from maybe the DASH diet for hypertension, which is pretty similar to the Mediterranean diet anyhow. So when you hear about all of these diets that strip the fat off the body and the, you know, the thigh and hip diet and the keto diet, the paleo diet, et cetera, et cetera, they're all fad diets. And yes, they might do acutely what they're suggested to do, but they, there's no science at all about the long-term health effects of these diets. Whereas with the Mediterranean diet, there's a huge amount of science. That's why I'm a great fan of the Mediterranean diet. I love that. Hey, Ross, do you know where the Mediterranean diet originated? Because I know that it's not all Europe that traditionally follow this style of eating. But, you know, I grew up in Egypt and we follow a Mediterranean diet. It's a, the, Our basic diet is very Mediterranean. So do you know where it started? Yeah, look, look. A lot of, again, there's a big misconception that they go, oh, Mediterranean, so therefore people live in Paris and Rome eat a Mediterranean diet. Nonsense. In fact, the, the weird thing about, about what happens in, in the big cities in, in the, around the Mediterranean is they don't start, they, they have the biggest meal at night, which is not the feature of the Mediterranean diet, and they start eating about nine o'clock at night, which is absolute lunacy. So, so, so really, it, it's been inspired by the traditional eating habits of people in the Mediterranean region, of course, that's why it's strangely called the Mediterranean diet, but especially in Southern Europe. So like its name suggests, it's primarily associated with the coastal countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea, like Southern Europe, Southern Italy, I'm an honorary Calabrian citizen because of my services to the bergamot fruit, which we'll talk about in the the next podcast. Um, So Southern Italy, Calabria, Sicily, Sardinia, uh, Greece, of course, a lot, a lot of areas around Greece, Spain, Crete, and as you say, 
uh, from Egypt. So anywhere around that Mediterranean basin, uh, even parts of the Middle East, where they eat a Mediterranean-style diet. And, and the style, the, the, this style of diet's been around since the Middle Ages, but it really became very popular in Western culture after the 1950s. There was a guy called Ansel Keys, and Ansel Keys uh, was this rather interesting man who actually finished his life in Italy. He moved to Italy and, and died at the age of 100 in Italy. But he published many, many years ago a thing called the the Seven Country Study, where he looked at 22 countries and and released the results of six. So why he called it the Seven Countries Trial, I don't know. But he was a strong proponent of the Mediterranean diet. So in, in, a, in a nutshell... The Mediterranean diet is characterized by the consumption of whole, minimally processed food, not that processed packaged muck masquerading as food that a lot of people eat. And it's basically plant-based. There's a lot of fruits and vegetables, different colors, legumes, of course, whole grains, lots of herbs, spices to flavor the food instead of using excessive salt and all the, 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 the preservatives and other nonsense we use in, in the West. Um, and healthy fats. So again... A lot of Ansel Key's work was misinterpreted as saying that low fat is the way to go. Cholesterol and fat caused heart disease. We know that that's now nonsense. Um, and so these healthy fats are actually very good for us, especially from extra virgin olive oil, nuts and seeds. And plus, keep yourself hydrated with a lot of water. Uh, and you've probably, probably heard or seen the Mediterranean diet's food pyramid, where the foods they eat mostly sit at the bottom, plus lots of water, water, uh, water for hydration. It sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? You know, I just want to make a note. Sicily is one of my all-time favorite places in the world. And I think, is it Ansel? His name is Smart Ansel Man. Keys. Ansel yeah, Keys. Yeah, moving to Italy to retire yeah. and then eventually live to 100. That's yep. incredible. I love his this. Wife, his wife, who was uh, his co-worker as well, she died at 97. So, <laughs> And they, they lived a Mediterranean lifestyle. So it was, it was quite exciting. A testament to it. Okay, yeah. tell us more. Well, you, you've probably heard, well, you would have heard being a dietitian, uh, the Mediterranean diet's food pyramid, where the foods they eat mostly sit at the bottom and the foods they eat less of move up the pyramid. And that's that's the point. We want to have most of our good foods down that bottom of the pyramid. So they're the things that we consume uh, most, of the, most of the week. So the foods that they have on a, on a daily basis uh, is, are things like Fish, seafood, which I've admitted I don't particularly like, but they, they certainly have a lot of fish. But the foods I just mentioned above uh, are the basis of most of their meals. So they eat those foods every single day. Then they also eat things like fish and seafood for protein most days of the week. And again, I've admitted I'm not much a fish, a fish person, but I do. People <laughs> enjoy their fish. It's a great thing to eat. I, I just love can't. it. I know, and I think it's fantastic <laughs> for you. I just don't like the taste. It makes, makes me feel sick when I eat it. Uh, poultry, eggs, cheese. cheese. Did oh. I say cheese? Yes, cheese is good say it food. again. And, and, say and cheese let, again. Oh, cheese again. <laughs> but let me say, the evidence shows the harder the cheese, the better it is for you. So so that's... I can uh, get down with that. Yep, I the, love hard cheese, like a good vintage yellow cheese. Yeah, mm. the feta cheese they have in Greece, all that beautiful stuff. Good yogurts, of course, in moderation throughout the week. Not every day, but maybe maybe at least twice a week. And they don't have as often things like red meats, sweets. Processed meats are just out. Uh, packaged, and people think, oh, salami is an Italian thing, but not in the, Medi- the true Mediterranean diet. They hardly a- ever have any sort of packaged foods. Of course, and of course, let's not forget, the occasional glass of red wine is consumed <laughs> with meals. So with nothing Your wrong favorite. with that. <laughs> yeah, well, well I, no, it's 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 something that I do enjoy, a couple of glasses of wine most so days of the week. So do I. Week. Look, yep. so do I. I love red wine. It doesn't love me, unfortunately. I find that whenever I have any sort of alcohol, all my, inf- like my joints inflame, like I'm like an old woman. Well, only I guess the joints of where I have injuries, I get like inflamed. But, you know, I don't think of it at the time. I'm like, it'll be fine. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Now, the Mediterranean diet isn't only a cultural phenomenon. It's also one of the most researched diets in the world, and it's got so many health benefits, like, you know, we've spoken about some of them. But, Ross, can you walk us through some of, like, the main or some of your favourite health benefits from the diet? Because I know you're a big advocate of this diet and something that you share with a lot of the clients that you see. Well, well, let's firstly look at what is it about the diet that gives you the benefits. And I think probably the key thing is that 
new buzzword, polyphenols. Now, what are polyphenols? Basically, that means plant chemicals. So really, the fact that the Mediterranean diet is so good for you, I believe, is because it's mainly plant-based. And as I say all the time, everyone should be having two or three pieces of fruit per day, three to five servings of vegetables per day. And tragically, in our society, less than 10% of people do it, whereas the people who have the proper Mediterranean diet, they all do that. So the polyphenols are a huge component. The extra virgin olive oil, which is the first pressing of the olives, is loaded with polyphenols. And here's a, here's a really interesting misconception people have. Extra light olive oil is better for you than extra virgin. That's complete nonsense. Extra virgin olive oil has the polyphenols with the monounsaturated fats, which is good fats, whereas extra light olive oil has the, the, the same amount of monounsaturated fat, which is good for you, but it's had all the polyphenols taken out. Oh, and extra light, doesn't it just mean lighter in colour or lighter in flavour? Yeah, it's not actually light, like lower no, fat. No, it's not, not at all. And they yeah. can't even spell light properly, L-I-T-E. It's just <laughs> nonsense. So so, so um, I, I think it's, it's they're, they're, they're the key thing. The omega-3 fats that are also in, in the fish and, and the nuts and everything else, and, and the antioxidants that's generally in those polyphenols. So, so, but, but the other thing that I say about the Mediterranean diet, it has an evidence base, a very strong evidence base for hard events. Now, what do I mean by that? So one of the major trials which was released in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago was called the PREDIMED study, where they looked at thousands of people over a number of years and found that those who followed mainly the Mediterranean diet versus those who followed a standard low-fat diet had a 30% reduction in death and heart disease just by doing that. There's work with, with a reduction in dementia, a reduction in cancers. So Look, the Mediterranean diet, it's a no-brainer. Everyone should be following it. Let me, let me just, yeah, you know, I just want to go back to a study of 26,000 women found that those who followed this type of diet, 25% less risk of developing cardiovascular disease over 12 years. Huge Wow, study. yeah, that's amazing. I can see why you tell everybody to be on this diet. Is this something that you follow as well in your own oh, yeah. life? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah, I, I would have a Mediterranean-style diet most of the time. Okay. Apart, from, apart from the fish, of course. I'm, I'm, of course. I'll part. admit that. I'll admit that. But look, please, everyone listening, it's my <laughs> own stuff. You know, it's a, so, Some things you just can't eat and fish is something I can't eat. I love fish. Mitch, my husband, he goes out spear fishing and he brings home the freshest fish that we cook or we eat sashimi straight away. And it is such a treat to be able to have such fresh fish. Mm, yeah, some I know you're like that. cringing yeah. right now. <laughs> no, I, I, look, I occasionally eat it, but I just don't enjoy it. That's no, I know. Now, Ross, I find what's so interesting about the Mediterranean diet is that it really helps to dispel this myth around low-fat diets being good for heart health, doesn't it? Because for so long, particularly, say, like 30 years ago, we were told to go low-fat to be healthy. But the Mediterranean diet is full of fats from things like olive oil and nuts and seeds and fatty fish. And I love that it does this because even I grew up, you know, I'm what in nearly 40, the diets that, you know, my, I could see my mum doing or the diets that I was exposed to were all low fat. We would get everything, low, even low fat cheese, which I do not recommend at all. But I love that the Mediterranean diet helps to dispel this myth. Yep. It does, and, and and I just want I focused on the the some of the hard events from the pretty med trial, but I just want to focus on some of the other benefits, health benefits from this. So so let's look at the the for example diabetes prevention. It shows that people who follow a Mediterranean diet have a much lower risk of developing type two diabetes. Uh, that was certainly shown in the pretty med trial. Another meta analysis, so, so where they put all the studies together, two thousand seventeen showed that the reduction of type 2 diabetes was about 19% by people who followed the Mediterranean diet. This benefits with cancer, as I mentioned, specifically colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and also prostate cancer. And that, that makes a lot of sense because, for example, with breast and prostate cancer, there is a direct link between uh, insulin resistance and people carrying extra weight and those two cancers. So the metabolic syndrome is very much associated with breast and prostate cancer. With colorectal cancer, we certainly know there are dietary associations there as well. Things like pro- processed meats increase your risk, whereas plant chemicals decrease your risk. 
So, so, I, so the cancer prevention is important. And also, I mean, the real scourge of modern society, when you think about it, apart from diabetes, is the risk of d- developing dementia. And there's strong work to show there's protective effects on cognitive t- function, on thinking, memory, and, and, and a significant reduction in risk for progression to Alzheimer's disease. So I, I think, think that the evidence is overwhelming for for the Mediterranean diet. Another interesting thing is now we're all moving into this anti-aging space and we should we should certainly have a, a big podcast about the latest in anti-aging. Uh, but cell damage through stress and inflammation can lead to age-related diseases and this has been linked to these things called telomeres, which are the little caps on the end of DNA, which gets shorter as you get older. Again, there's been some studies to show that people who follow a Mediterranean diet have longer telomeres. So it's a an anti-aging diet as well as an anti-disease diet. But mind you, and this is something we should talk about in another podcast, I believe that all modern degenerative diseases come from the fact that we are aging. So if you can work on the aging process, then you can prevent diseases. So really interesting stuff. I want to go back to the point, Ross, where you were talking about the diabetes prevention, you know, the reduction in insulin resistance, the cancer prevention. Do you think that's because the Mediterranean diet doesn't have space for all this processed food and sort of refined sugars? Like when you look at the diet, it's very wholesome. It's very what grows, swims, you know, it's very uh, like there's no processed food in it. Do you think that that's the contribution to these preventative diseases? To an extent, yes, uh, because you see, the, the, the problem is that 30% of Caucasians, 50% of Asians, and 100% of people with darker or olive skin, we, we're putting you with Egyptian background, have, have are born with the gene for insulin resistance. Oh, wait, I don't but, want that. I was no, all claiming it, like, yeah, that's me. And now I'm like, no, no, I don't want this. <laughs> yeah, but your genes loads the gun, then your environment pulls the trigger. So if you then flog that gene, that insulin resistant gene, with excessive sugar and you're not feeding in the plant chemicals as well. So the plant chemicals give you the benefits, the monounsaturated fat, the omega-3s give you the benefits, but all the, all the, the, the processed sugars, so the refined sugars and the preservatives and the additives and all of those things, then damage that insulin receptor and make it even worse so, so you get more and more insulin resistance. So I think that's the link. Fascinating. And what do you think, I don't know if you know this answer, I'm sure you will because you are Dr. Ross, but what is the link between, say, the Mediterranean diet and the telomeres, like the length of the telomeres? Again, that gets back to what I'm saying about the whole anti-aging thing, that because you are feeding in these high-quality polyphenols, plant chemicals, into your DNA, we're talking now epigenetics. So so just to give you one example, and again, there's another great uh, concept for a, a podcast to talk about epigenetics, but, but here... When you have a diet that's high in a lot of leafy green vegetables, there's natural folates in that. And when you have natural folates, you're affecting what is called the MTHFR gene, which which is abnormal in 50% of people around the world. 50% have a mutation in this gene. And, and the only way you can fix up that mutation is to feed in the natural folates, which then have this epigenetic mechanism to keep your telomeres longer. And that's that's the key. Because every time your te- your DNA divides, the telomeres just get that little bit shorter. So the caps on the end of the DNA get frayed, get smaller, and the, so the DNA is more prone then to mutations. So if you can do so if you do everything to keep those telomeres long, then your DNA is tighter, tighter, more packed in, less chance for mutations. And you do that through these epigenetic mechanisms, one of them being the MTHFR gene being fixed up by the plant chemicals. Okay. Is there a way we can measure the length of our telomeres? Oh, there's, there, there are research tools. You can't go to a, your local pathology and say, can I have a telomere test, please, doctor? It doesn't <laughs> work yet. But, but there, there are research, research ways of measuring telomere length. And, and I've got to say, just a, a bit of a plug for Australia, uh, Professor Elizabeth Blackburn won the Nobel Prize, I think it was in the, in the early 2000s, could have been just before that, for discovering telomerase, which is the enzyme that keeps your telomeres short, uh, long, I mean, keeps them long. So she she won the Nobel Prize, her and a couple of other researchers. So there's an Australian Nobel Prize for you there. Wonderful. Yeah, I love it. 
And I know that some of the other benefits of the Mediterranean diet are things like reducing inflammation. So the anti-inflammatory properties due to the high intake of those wonderful fruits and vegetables and healthy fats uh, is great for, you know, the reduction of inflammation. Also, I love this part of it is lowering the risk of mental health disorders like depression, like we discussed in last week's episode. And the other one that I really love is improved gut health. We know that our gut is connected to like everything in our in our body, including our, our brain, our mental health, our serotonin, like we've talked about. And, and the improvement of gut health comes back again to the basics of having a diet that's so rich in fiber. Lots of fruits and veggies and nuts and whole grains and all of these things support a healthy gut microbiota, which we will be doing a full episode on very soon. And while food is a really big part of the Mediterranean way of living, you know, we've been talking a lot about the Mediterranean diet. It's not the only thing that contributes to the studied health benefits, is it? Like, it's also their lifestyle practices. Like, I know that they move their bodies regularly. I know that they've got a wonderful sense of community, which we might not see so much in the West. Would you say, Ross, is that Oh, accurate? yeah, and that, that's that's the point. We probably shouldn't be talking about the Mediterranean diet, rather the Mediterranean lifestyle. So it's not just what they're eating, it's how they're doing it, when they're doing it. So, for example, they have a very good, wholesome breakfast with a lot of fruits and grains. Then they go and burn off any extra carbs in the hot Mediterranean sun in the fields, Then they come back home at lunchtime, have their biggest meal at lunchtime with a bit of pasta, a glass of red wine, get a bit sleepy, have a sleep, the the old siesta after lunch. And that's been shown, study of 23,000 Greeks, those who have an afternoon sleep, 40% reduction in cardiovascular disease. The working Greeks, not many of those left, I'm joking, uh, uh, 50% reduction in cardiovascular disease just by having an afternoon sleep and then burn off any extra carbs in the hot Mediterranean sun in the afternoon and they don't have a big meal at night. Now, we do the reverse of that in our society. Maybe some people skip breakfast, a bit for lunch, snack in between time. I know you're a, a cereal snacker. Um, and, and then a huge evening meal and sit, sit in front of that damn thing called television and don't burn off any fat. So, you see, the, body's not, the body is not like a car. With a car, you put the fuel in, use it when you want to. With the body, if you put the fuel in and you don't burn it off, it then gets laid down as fat. So it's, it's, it's so you look at the Mediterranean lifestyle, they're, they're actually working around when they do their activity and fueling that activity, but not having much at night time. I want to know why in the world we don't follow a Mediterranean lifestyle. It sounds so good. We're talking wine, siestas, community, like all the things that really we love. Also dark chocolate. Like why don't we do that? Why do we work all the way through and have, our biggest meal at dinner, like what went wrong? Well, I, I want to pick up on a really important point you made. The other, the other thing is these people live in villages that are often on the side of a hill, and, and but they're living in villages close together. They have all they see the people they see every day. They know them, so they have this communal lifestyle. They they don't have cars. They've never heard of gyms. They've never heard of Lipitor, uh, and they're walk walking up these hills and down these hills all day. And they're close together, so they can come home and have lunch together with their family or with their friends. And, and whereas in our society, that we live in in cities that are spread out, it takes mo- well, hours to get into work. This horrible commute that many people have to do. And, and they, they don't have the chance. They go to work, they have a half an hour for lunch, maybe an hour for lunch. They don't have a chance to have a sleep. What do they do? They go to do? Get under their desk and have a sleep. That, that doesn't happen either. Um, and, and then they, they, they get home, they're exhausted, they have a big evening meal, they watch television. So, so we, we've completely screwed the way we've lived because of overpopulation, hugely populated cities, polluted cities. I mean, oh, this is another topic, but it's an important point. One in six deaths around the world now are directly linked to some form of air pollution. Now, these people living in the Mediterranean villages, they're not exposed to this stuff. So, so there are all, so many factors that, that go to keeping these people healthy, which gets back to the Blue Zone uh, discussions about people who live in these little pockets that have the enormous longevity. So interesting. You know, one thing that, you know, we, we spoke about community briefly before and One of the biggest things that my family struggled with when we moved from Egypt to the West, so we moved to New Zealand and and now we live in Australia, 
is the difference in the sense of community. Like in Egypt, every single weekend, our entire family, I'm talking, so my grandma was one of 10 siblings. And so all her generation and then my mum's generation and then my generation, we all had like buildings basically that were right next to each other on the Suez Canal. And so every weekend we would go to a holiday home and we would there, and there were no fences between these, like four properties with four stories. So there was a lot of us. And we would be there every weekend. We'd share every single meal together. We'd debrief about our weeks. We'd sit and play board games. And this was a weekly thing. But also the community there in Egypt, and, and I'm sure it's similar in the Mediterranean, is, you know, family is everything and friends are everything. Like we would treat each other truly like we would want someone to treat us. And I think, I'm not saying it doesn't happen like that in the West, but it, I don't feel like it's the same level, I would say, of connection. It certainly was a culture shock when we moved. Well, I've, and we spoke last week and we've spoken quite a bit on this podcast series about the importance of not feeling socially isolated. And that's yeah. the wonderful thing about these blue zones, about the Mediterranean area, about what you just told us. And you, you said you lived on the Suez Canal. Are you sure you weren't living in denial? Sorry, that's a, an Egyptian <laughs> oh joke. My there. God. Oh, sorry. So, so, sorry. That was a pharaoh, up the, up, the, pharaoh up the denial for that joke. But anyhow, um, sorry. A double whammy. A double whammy, Someone sorry. Someone rescue me, please. <laughs> but what I'm saying is is that is that that's another factor. And this is the problem when you talk about randomized controlled clinical trials. You can't do a randomized controlled clinical trial of a diet because there are all of those other factors there involved. It's not as if you're giving a pill in a diet as opposed to a placebo in a, in a diet. It's, just, it's impossible. But, but you see, I don't really care, to be frank with you. What I care about is that it works. The whole thing works. The whole blue zone lifestyle works. The Mediterranean lifestyle works. It works. And it's what we should be striving for. So in our, in our society, we should be striving to, have, to try and simulate this as much as we can in the realm of how we live. And, and going with that is exactly what you say. Look at the importance of friends and family and, and, and really highlight that. And it's what I talk about on my um, when I'd give a professional talk. People are, are climbing the ladder to success to find they're on the wrong wall. Get on the right wall. And the right wall is all the stuff we're talking about. Yeah. And I know that one of the five keys to health that you talk about, Ross, is happiness. And that community, that social connection, eating with one another, it really fosters happiness, which we know is linked to longevity and improved health, et cetera. Which, so I'm going to propose that there are treadmills that put on every aeroplane, every airport, and there are like sleeping pods in every office so that we can normalize siestas and regular movement. What do you reckon? Should we lobby well, for this? I don't think the treadmill will work on the uh, on the planes, oh, but why? I certainly the sleeping pod. Um, well, uh, turbulence and uh, you, you've got the seatbelt on. Strap yourself in. Do, uh, well, if, if they can do that, sure. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't don't think it'll take off. I'm going to try anyway because uh, good, good idea. I cannot sit still for 17 hours. I've got to go to South Africa soon, and the 17 hour flight. I'm already dreading it because I I'm going to I pace up and down the car. I'm that annoying person who paces. Because I can't sit still. Well, my strong advice to you is get an aisle seat. Don't drive other people crazy oh, by climbing over Oh, I do. Don't worry. Them. Yeah, <laughs> don't worry. Yeah. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about the diet or pattern of eating, I should say. And we know that it comes with this huge range of incredible life-changing health benefits. I now want to take a closer look at what a typical day on a plate is for people following this diet. So I want to get really practical. And what we've done is we reached out to our incredible experts, the amazing dietitians at Miyagi, to help us out here. And here's what they had to say. So they literally like gave me what a typical day of eating on the Mediterranean diet. And it involves a whole range of variety of awesome things. So let's say breakfast. It might start off looking like a Greek yogurt parfait. Now, if you don't know what a parfait is, because I didn't, I had to Google what a parfait was. It's essentially Greek yogurt, and it's layered with things like berries, nuts, whole grains, like granola, or some like for some extra crunch, 
maybe a drizzle of honey, and you just layer it. And then you can call it a fancy word like parfait. Isn't that's that just cool? called my breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> that's 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 what I, I have for breakfast. I didn't even, even know it was a parfait. There, there you yeah. go. Are you a fancier than you realize, Ross? Or if you're not into the parfait, you could have an egg omelet with some veggies tossed through it, a slice of whole grain toast. In Egypt, I always grew up on shakshuka. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's like, oh, it's like a whole lot of like tomatoes or like, tom- like diced tomatoes and then you crack eggs in it and there's capsicum and onion and you cook it up and then you serve it with some whole grain bread, although we used to eat white bread, but whole grain bread for the Mediterranean diet and it was wow, so good, so good. Lunch what about lunch? Yeah. might look like, say, salad with lots of different coloured vegetables. So you want that lovely rainbow on your plate. So lettuce, tomato, cucumber, olives, feta cheese, a bit of quinoa tossed through it, like as the whole grain sauce, for example. You might want to throw in some legumes like canned beans as protein or even like chicken drizzled with, of course, olive oil and some lemon. Or you can have something like a pasta with tomato sauce uh, with lots of veggies. So I love to put things like onion, garlic and whatever other veggies I've got around, I'll throw into my pasta. And of course, herbs, fresh herbs, ideally, oregano, basil, it can throw in some legumes and sometimes with a glass of wine so you can have a siesta. Now, dinner could be something like, you're not going to like this one, Ross, but maybe like a baked fish, like cod or sea bass, seasoned with, again, olive oil, garlic, lemon, a mix of Mediterranean herbs. You could do sweet potatoes or whole grain couscous on the side. It's so easy to cook couscous. Like, it takes like two minutes. It's my go-to whole grain couscous sometimes. Or some steamed broccoli or a green salad with mixed veggies and a simple vinaigrette. Served, again, with a glass of wine. Occasionally, occasionally. Now, the Mediterraneans, like me, like to snack. Yeah. So they might snack on things like hummus with veggies like cucumber or carrots, a handful of nuts and seeds, a piece of fruit or avocado with whole grain crackers, or whole grainy Rusty bread dipped in extra virgin olive oil. Ross, I don't know about you, but this is making me feel hungry. Well, we're all very aware, aware of the Pavlovian response. Um, my mouth is <laughs> absolutely watering. Can we please get on with it? Because I, I want to go and eat. This is... I reckon. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, look, I really want to make some changes to my diet and eat more like the Mediterraneans do, then we've got some hot tips from our dietitians that can get you started. So tip number one, use olive oil instead of other oils and fats for cooking and dressing salads. Ditch the butter, ditch the canola oil and other forms of fat to boost monounsaturated fat in your diet, which is also going to provide all those wonderful antioxidants, which help to prevent things like cancer and help you to live longer. And and keep your cell membranes a lot healthier. Cell membranes, telomeres, all the things. All of the, all of the above. <laughs> now, tip number two is slowly increase your intake of fruits and vegetables. So less than 10% of Aussies eat the recommended amount of having two fruits and five vegetables a day. And this is an integral part of the Mediterranean diet. So here are some ideas to help you along, some little hot tips or life hacks that you can implement to try to increase your veggie intake. So you could toss some spinach and berries into your morning smoothies. I do this. You can add mushrooms, tomatoes, spinach to your morning eggs on toast or even avocado. That's like four four veggies right there. Use snack time to get your fruit and veggies in. So veggie sticks like carrots, snow peas, capsicum with hummus or tzatziki, or just eat a piece of fruit. Even pair it with some Greek yogurt. Call it a parfait if you want. Our producer, Cam, just sits there and munches on a whole carrot (laughs) as a good dietitian would. (laughs) We love you, Cam. And then lean on canned or frozen veggies. So like canned corn, black beans, do a Mexican taco mix or a chili con carne, and then grate veggies into your sauce. I love doing this. I will grate things like zucchini, carrots, I'll chop up mushrooms, onions, garlic, and I'll put them in whatever sort of tomato sauce I'm making. Sounds Sounds great to me. (laughs) So. <laughs> I know that you don't cook, Ross. I know that your wife does all the cooking. Do you have a favourite meal that she makes? 
I do. We 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 just maybe just a piece of chicken, um, just just fried piece of chicken in, in olive oil, of course, with this beautiful salad, which has all of the things you've just mentioned in a salad. And I just absolutely love it. In fact, we're having it tonight for dinner, which I'm looking Ooh, forward to. Love it. I love that you already know what you're having for dinner. Like it's literally 10 a.m. I have no idea what I'm having for dinner. She told me yesterday. That's oh, all. I love that. Yeah. Well done, wifey. Now, there's two more tips from our dietitians. So tip three is aim to have one vegetarian meal per week. And this is where you can eat more legumes. So I know that a lot of people have done like meat-free Mondays, which I think is a really cool idea. So you can have like a lentil spag bowl, nachos with lots of veggies, black beans, kidney beans, top it with some avo and Greek yogurt or sour cream, have a chickpea curry or a dal. And in winter, you could do like a lentil soup. And that's a really easy one. I dated a guy once who was vegetarian and he was obsessed with lentil pies. So I learned to make the world's best lentil pie. Uh, and no wonder that relationship didn't <laughs> last. God. Hey, the Mediterraneans would have appreciated it. <laughs> All right. The last tip I've got for you is switch to whole grains, which is a great way to boost fiber and feed all the awesome gut microbiome. Now, this doesn't have to be arduous. You just do it in simple ways, like switch off your bread from like white bread to whole grain and white pasta to whole grain pasta. It's it's actually, it doesn't taste any, I actually really like the taste of whole grain. I think it has a really beautiful texture. And if it's something that you're not used to, you will get used to it. Your taste buds change and you'll learn to love it. So look, I, I think that's a great summary of uh, how we should be eating and the whole the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. So let's go to the member question of the week. And this is from Anna, Dr. Gina. So the question is directed at you, Gina. I heard you talk about breath work. So we did speak about breath work in a previous episode and you said you've really started to get into it. And I, I sp- spoke about James Nestor's book, Breathe, which I think is one of the, apart from your book, which is, what's called, what's that book called the again? The Habit Jim? Revolution. That's it, The Thanks, Habit Ross. Revolution. Yeah, right. Uh, apart team, from that, right. this is one of the best health books. <laughs> it's a good, good shameless plug. I love a shameless <laughs> plug for anything. Um, is, is James Nestor's book, Breathe, is a magnificent health book to read as well. So what, what Anna wants to know, can, can you tell her a little bit more about what, what is breath work, what, what the benefits are, because she wants to give it a try? Oh, and it's such a good question. Now, I'm a newbie at breath work, so... I'm just going to give you what I know about it, but I'm hoping to know a lot more about it as I continue the practice of it. But practicing breathwork is essentially using techniques, using your breath to facilitate like long, deep breathing. It could be breathing through your like belly or your chest. It could be breathing through one nostril at a time. Like there's so many different types of breathworks that you can do. And some of them, some of them are actually designed to increase your energy like if you breathe faster, some of them are designed to relax you if you breathe nice and slowly and deeply. And I think what's amazing is that our nervous system is directly linked to our breath. So as we say reduce our breath rate, our blood pressure goes down, our heart rate goes down, our stress levels go down. So how I've been using breath work is I've been doing it just before sleep. It's sort of like my new little routine. And I use an app because I'm not disciplined to do it myself because I'll probably just like stop counting. But I use an app and it guides me through a slow breathwork practice. I do it for anywhere between sort of five to 15 minutes, depending how tired I'm feeling. What I And that, sorry, that app is called? It's, well, there's plenty, but my one is called Open, O-P-E-N. That's the app that I'm using. What I've noticed from using it is that I have definitely slept better. Like I spend longer time in deep sleep, which I know from uh, because I can track my sleep with my Fitbit watch. So I have longer time in deep sleep. I get to sleep quicker, which is great for me. And I know that some of the research shows that it's like breath work is great for your immune system, balancing blood pressure, uh, reduced feelings of like stress, reducing ruminating thoughts, It's also got some great benefits with like hormones, like changing or balancing out hormones, better mental focus. Like there's so many benefits to breath work. And I feel like it's a lost art and something that I would love to normalize again. Ross, I know that you meditate every day. Is part of that breath work? 
Yeah, when, before I go to bed, I, I have a routine that I use as well. Very, very similar to what you're saying. I, I don't use an app, but I, I have a, a little thing on my phone, uh, which is called Sleep by Max Richter, which I listen to all night. So it's uh, so so basically, it's that that I I use the breath work to get me into this deep sleep that it goes into. So it's good. We've been talking about all things Mediterranean diet, and we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Wherever you're listening to today, please hit subscribe so you don't miss when a new episode drops. That's all from us today. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week for more conversations with me, Dr. Gina Cleo, and my co-host, Dr. Ross Walker. Bye.